<laughs> All right. So the question says, what is the ideal banking angle for a gentle turn of 1.4 kilometer radius? Okay. So this is going to be our R, radius of curvature, on a highway with a 100 kilometer per hour. So this is going to be our, um, our, um, speed of the traveling vehicle let me call that just a v naught or i could just call it v understanding the v is going to be constant speed limit um assuming everyone travels at the oh yeah i was just gonna assume that <laughs> okay um yeah so there are some there are some assumptions uh some um things that they presume that uh, we are on the same page about for example when they call something ideal banking angle, what are they? What do they mean? Um, so this is the scenario that you are thinking of. Uh, you are uh, I, for these scenarios. I always have to draw two pictures. One is the top-down view because that lets me draw uh, what the curve of the road looks like. So imagine looking at the road from top above, like a bird's eye view, then what the situation is describing is you have a section of a road that's curving and uh, that amount of curvature here it can be described by describing the radius that this curve is a part of a circle of um, and on this curved road you have some vehicle that's moving at some speed well, I mean, you know, as it moves, the speed is going to change direction. And that's the whole idea of centripetal acceleration, that as this vehicle moves along this path in a constant speed, it is accelerating because its velocity is changing. So you have this top view. Now, the top view will inevitably miss one aspect of this picture because it's asking about banking angle. And banking angle is how slanted the road is. And that's not going to be visible from top. That's only going to be visible from the cross section of the road. So I need to draw, our, I don't know, uh, draw a rear view. And from a rear view, I need to pick a spot. Let's say pick uh, this cross section here, imagining I'm looking at it uh, from straight back. Then what I'm going to see is I'm going to see a cross section of the road. And this is where I can label the theta, and I'm going to see the car, so, uh, which is traveling at some speed v into the road, or not into the road, into the page, or uh, in into the page. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's the setup, and this part of the setup that gets uh, some time to get used to, and uh, I spend the time in the lecture. And I would ask you to uh, make sure you don't move on too quickly without ensuring that you fully understood it. Is the answer to this question, what direction is the car accelerating? So in answering the question, first you need to figure out that it is indeed accelerating. It's kind of what this picture is showing. It is accelerating. And this is the second question of what direction is also an important one. Because I've seen students make a mistake because this looks so much like the inclined plane, make the mistake thinking, oh, direction of acceleration, that's down the plane. No, it's not. The direction of acceleration in case like this, uh, assuming the car isn't sliding up the road or sliding down the road, that relative to the where the road is, the car is stationary within that width of the road, the direction of acceleration is a straight horizontal. Uh, the acceleration, if it's a centripetal acceleration, it must point towards the center of the circle. And that's what this uh, horizontal acceleration does. So um, that has to be the very first realization, the very first thing you know, you know this. Um, so that as you are drawing free body diagrams, you draw forces correctly, one. Two, as you choose your coordinate axis, you choose your axis, um, not the one that goes along the incline, but uh, uh, along one that does actually go along the same direction as the acceleration itself. 
So, uh, so let me go through our standard strategy steps. Step number one is to draw free body diagram. Oh, I need to draw a free body diagram. Um, uh, let me draw it, draw it here. I already labeled the free body diagram, so <laughs> let's all draw it here. So this is my representation of the car. Doesn't need to be any fancier than that. Um, so I think through, okay, what forces can there be on the car? Well, there's always going to be gravity. So let me write that first. Uh, gravity. And then I think through, okay, I took care of the only non-contact force I can have. So what are the contact forces on the car? What things are touching the car? And I hope <laughs> by now people have gotten out of the habit of saying things like air resistance. I don't know why so many students to say it. And in, you know, in this class, we almost... Um, um, we almost never deal with their resistance, not because they don't exist, but because they are so difficult to deal with. And I think uh, um, before physics 4A, sometimes the people get into this habit of, you know, mentioning complications because that's the smart thing to do. And in, this is the class where I want to teach you how to do what we call back of the envelope calculations kind of estimates and calculations you can do by hand that doesn't require complicated simulation. This, that is your starting place. And as you move on your science and engineering education, you're going to build back up to those complications. The difference between now and the later will be that, that later you, you will actually be able to fully quantitatively include those complications instead of just mentioning them to sound smart without doing anything. Um, so anyways, no air resistance. I'm not going to label that. Um, now, we do have one thing that's touching the uh, car, that's the road. So there's going to be contact forces from the road. So we are going to have normal force. In fact, that's a big portion of force that's needed to ensure that the car doesn't accelerate downward along the direction of acceleration. And here for this question, it does take a little bit of a work to say that we are not going to write down friction because... Um, if someone had told me, oh, yeah, we, there, we should consider friction with the road, I would say, yeah, we definitely should. That friction, the friction coefficient between the tire and the road is not going to be negligible. And this is where I lean on the phrase ideal banking angle. So this is something that you have to be familiar with having seen this description before. So when the road is not banked, um, when the normal force points straight up, then what does provide the necessary centripetal force for centripetal acceleration is friction. Um, so if the road wasn't banked at all, then you would include the friction and friction would serve a role there. And even when the road is banked, nothing stops us from having a friction that either points one way or the other way. And that... Um, that's part of how the car either stays on the road or uh, there's some extreme where they will slide off the road. All of that is possible. And what limits us here is that the sense in which this banking angle is considered ideal is that the car is able to turn without friction being involved. So for that reason, uh, we say no friction for this situation. So. This is our complete free body diagram. And this is consistent with the, our direction of acceleration because we can arrange everything in such a way that the vertical component of normal force exactly con cancels out the vertical component of gravity. And this remaining horizontal component is what provides the centripetal force. Um, also, I guess I should define my coordinate axis. Let's do that. We already identified the direction of acceleration. So let me call this my positive x and the other direction my y. Um, okay, that was step number three. Three? Three, no, step number two. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that was step number two. Uh, step number three is decomposing forces into components. I did it halfway here. I was decomposing my normal force into horizontal and vertical components. So, okay, so I, I guess uh, maybe what I should spend a little bit of time on is identifying the angle 
and actually giving an expression for these uh, components. So this uh, usually takes some auxiliary figures. So let's imagine that this is my incline of the, uh, or the banking of the road. So if this is theta, then this angle is theta, the one that I just drew. And if this is theta, then this is 90 degree minus theta, because this is 90 degrees. Okay, so far so good. And now because this is 90 degrees, then this angle here is 90 degrees minus this angle, which is 90 degrees minus theta. Work through all that. The end result is that this angle here is what should be labeled as theta. And having identified the angle theta, now you have everything you need to write down the expressions for the two components of normal force. A horizontal component, which will be, since it's opposite to the angle, this will be n sine theta. And the vertical component of the uh, normal force, since it's adjacent to the angle, it'll be n cosine theta. Did I lose a bar from theta? Oh, no, I did not. Okay, okay. Uh, and cosine theta. Okay, so these two are the components of the normal force. Okay, so that's uh, step number three. And uh, I think we are ready to do step number four. The step number four is writing down Newton's second law equations. And uh, if you've spent enough time going through steps one, two, and three, step number four is as a simple as looking at your free body diagram and writing down the information that is present in the diagram. So you have um, net force in the x direction. Okay, what are my, okay, uh, only my uh, component of the normal force is that force. So n sine theta is equal to the Newton's second law, mass times acceleration in the x direction, in which in this case it's the entirety. So mass times the acceleration. And here you can actually go one step further because we do happen to know this is a centripetal acceleration. And uh, with the centripetal acceleration, really the common feature is that a lot of questions tend to give you what it is by giving you the velocity and radius of curvature uh, using uh, relying on the formula. The centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So um, so let me plug that in, since I'm going to need to do that in the end, so I'll just do that now. Mass times V squared over R. Okay, that's one equation. And um, and yeah, and I, <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, can I avoid not writing down my other equation? And looking at it, I think I have to, because looking at the equation, I don't know theta, what I'm trying to solve for. And while I'm okay with the right hand side, I don't know the normal force. So I think I'm gonna need my second equation to actually finish solving. So let me write down my second equation that involves the forces in the y direction. So net force in the y direction is equal to and cosine theta for the adjacent side, uh, upward, minus the gravity, so minus mg, or I could write fg, but that's gonna be mg is equal to zero. The net force in the y direction cancels out. So, so looking at here, it looks like I have equations one and two. And for uh, this second equation, I didn't introduce any new unknowns. So I still have two unknowns, two equations. I can solve it. Let's solve it. So the systematic way to approach this would be to say, okay, in the very end, I want an expression for theta. Okay. Um, so let me first uh, solve one of the two equations, not for theta, but for the other unknown, n. And the thinking behind this is that um, we are going to eliminate whatever it is that we are solving for first. We want to eliminate n. So uh, solving for n, I think it's easier to do out of equation two. So let me do that from equation two. You get, um, I'm just gonna do this in my head. Uh, if necessary, pause and make sure you can follow. N is equal to mg divided by cosine theta. Uh, out of, this is what I solve out of equation two. And now this is what I mean by we are going to eliminate N. We are going to plug in N into the other equation so that uh, other equation combined with this expression 
we get so instead of n, I have mg over cosine theta times sine theta is equal to mv squared over r. This actually gives me a bit of a comfort because I was writing down this m and I didn't even count it as one of the unknowns, but I'm not given what m is for the cars and I'm glad to see that it's gonna cancel out so I didn't have to do anything about it. I didn't need to know. I don't have to assume any values. Okay, we are all good. Um, okay, looking at this expression, I think I see some possibilities for simplification. So you have sine over cosine, or you can combine those two trig functions into just one. That is a tangent theta. And uh, if I move g over to the other side, then this is what I would end up with. Uh, let me write it over here what we end up with is tangent theta is equal to v squared over rg and this is basically the equation expression that you need to solve for the theta here and there's a couple additional steps to go through which i guess uh, which some of you might have skipped without any adverse impact um, but it comes down to so you could solve for theta by putting both the sides through arctangent. Then on the left-hand side, arctangent or tangent of theta becomes just, well, that's theta for you. And on the right-hand side, you get arctangent of v squared over rg. And make sure your calculator is calculating it in theta units. And, um, um, and this expression here, in this particular case, this turns out to be perfectly correct. It's good. You can just do that. That's why I'm saying people might not have noticed that any was, anything was wrong. Uh, the thing you have to be careful about for other questions in the future has to do with how large theta is. Because arctangent, by definition, it will always yield the result of an angle that's for uh, that's larger than minus 90 degrees and less than 90 degrees. That's the restricted range of arctangent so that we can use it like a function. Um, but um, there are angles that's going to be, there are going to be obtuse angles that's uh, bigger than 90 degrees. So if you have a situation like that, then you do have to be careful. I do want to say that this is the expression I like to fall back on because this is a correct expression for, uh, or it would normally be a correct expression for all angles. In this particular case, I guess the right-hand side, it never can be negative, so, all right. Uh, so, okay, yeah, so this is the answer. The theta is equal to arctangent of v squared over rg. Uh, one last word of caution, make sure you're converting uh, V into basic SI units, R into basic SI units of meter. And, um, and I guess if you don't want to do tedious unit conversion by hand, you can always use Ultram Alpha as well. Just make sure to put the units so that Ultram Alpha knows uh, how to handle it. Wow, that question took a little longer than I thought it would. Um, so we have that question. Um, a little bit hesitant to do question 10 now because it's basically the same thing. It's a basically this uh, exact same picture, exact same equation, exact same everything. Really, the only thing that changes is um, what I'm going to highlight here. So um, for the previous question, we said, all right, um, the normal force and, and angle theta are the unknown. Uh, let's uh, solve for them. When you read the next two question carefully, it says, what is the ideal speed? Okay, so no friction, good. To take the uh, 83 millimeter radius curve, bank test, uh, oh, I'm given the angle. Oh, then you realize, oh, right, we are not given the speed, we have to solve for it. So going back to this set of equations that you could go through the exact same steps and drive, what you'll find is that, um, so normal force, you are still not given, so you'll have to solve for it in one of the equations and eliminate it. Now, theta is given, determined, not going to change. 
mass we are hoping it will cancel out again and it's this velocity v that we are looking for so um, it's still the same approach and i think from what we've done in the previous question to modify a lot of people can do it in the three four minutes it took me to say it out loud so um, yeah so let me leave that question there and not explicitly do it at this session